the book of Ezra part 3 in the course of studying this book of Ezra I have found a big discrepancy in uh, chronological timeline which thus far I am unable to explain I uh, am unaccustomed to teaching something that I am unable to explain but in this case after doing uh, quite a lot of research on this I am still unable to explain what I'm about to tell you so uh, you can take it uh, as you will the discrepancy lies within the line of the kings of uh, Medo-Persia in um, chapter 4 verses 6 and 7 of this book of Ezra it is claimed that King Ahasuerus of Persia was written letters filled with accusations by the uh, Samaritan, the Samaritans the adversaries of Judah against the children of Judah and then it states likewise that King Artaxerxes was uh, likewise written letters and it states that um, because of these letters that King Artaxerxes was the king who stopped the Jews that is to say those of the tribe of Judah and Benjamin from building in Jerusalem because of what the Samaritans had written to him making lying accu accusations against them and it says that the work ceased until the second year of Darius if we read chapter 4 verse 24 which was the uh, last verse of the last lecture it clearly states then work ceased on the house of God which is at Jerusalem so it ceased unto which means until the second year of the reign of Darius king of Persia implying that Artaxerxes was before Darius or Darius and uh, unless this means that Darius is Artaxerxes uh, it doesn't make any sense it's not made clear in the Bible neither in Hebrew nor in the Aramaic uh, slash Syriac in the book of Daniel chapter 9 verse 1 it states in the first year of Darius the son of Ahasuerus of the seed of the Medes which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans uh, right there you, you have it written that Ahasuerus is the father or uh, perhaps the grandfather of Darius because when you go into the Hebrew there is no word for grandson or grandfather but according to all the historical timelines that I have looked up of the kings of Persia and that's been quite a few of them Darius was before Ahasuerus and Artaxerxes yet we have in Daniel 9 1 that Darius was after Ahasuerus king of Persia as either his son or his grandson again I know there is no word for grandson or grandfather in the Hebrew so the word son is uh, utilized um, you've seen this many times in the Bible but according to some of the timelines I have looked at Darius was the son of Cyrus other timelines claim that uh, Cyrus had two kings after him uh, one being named Bardius and the other one being named Cambyses. Then came Xerxes, then Ahasuerus, then Artaxerxes. Uh, some even show Xerxes as being Ahasuerus and Artaxerxes as being his son. Other timelines do not show um, Bardus or Cambus at all like I said and uh, neither are these kings mentioned in the Bible whatsoever but this is what has led me to the point where I am now 
I am an honest teacher of the Word of God, and um, if I do not know or understand something, then I will say so. Well, this is one of those areas that I do not know and do not understand, have been unable to ascertain the truth of it. All of this does not line up chronologically correctly, because Artaxerxes cannot be king before Darius, and then king after Darius as well. Um, there was an Artaxerxes II. There was an uh, Darius II. However, they are later in timeline than uh, this time that we're speaking of in the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. So then, I am at a loss to be able to explain this to you, the student, as to who is the actual king mentioned in the upcoming chapters, because Artaxerxes, mentioned in chapter 4, seems to be against Judah in the building of the temple, whereas the upcoming Artaxerxes seems to be happily willing to accommodate Judah and the building of the temple and the wall, and providing animals in silver and gold, and uh, he would seem to be more like King Dyrus than Artaxerxes. But in the upcoming chapter uh, 6, verse 14, it reads, And the elders of the Jews builded, and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai, and the prophet Zechariah, son of Edo, and they builded and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel, and according to the commandment of Cyrus, and Darius, or Darius, and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. So this would lead one to believe that uh, Cyrus was the king, then Darius, then Artaxerxes. I have run into some... Um, theories online by scholars that Artaxerxes and Darius are one and the same. But that really doesn't make sense. So um, are these in order in chapter 6 verse 14? I, I don't know. Are there two kings named Artaxerxes? Well, yes there are, but uh, Artaxerxes II comes later and uh, Darius II seems to have been at odds with Judah and also occurs too late in timeline to be the good Darius who we know was helpful to Judah with the building of the temple. So, um, I am sorry, I just do not know um, what to say about this. This is one area I have been unable to ascertain the truth of who is who and which king is which in this timeline with regards to the king of Persia of these times. It is my assumption that Artaxerxes mentioned in the upcoming chapters of 6 and 7 is in fact Darius. And again, there are scholars out there who have written um, letters on this which would seem to back this up because of inscriptions found on tombs. However, uh, I have no way of proving this the one way or the other. Because I cannot go over to the Holy Land and look at the inscriptions and compare them and uh, make sure who is who. Um, but it does appear that this Darius is in fact the Artaxerxes mentioned coming up in the next or in uh, chapter 6 and 7. Because of his cooperation with the children of Israel, either that or there is another Artaxerxes which uh, is not shown in the times lines which I have looked at. And I've looked at about 8 or 10 of them, and all of them disagree on years. Very, very few of them disagree about the, or uh, agree about the timeline. And that's not hard to understand because many people set the date of the captivity 110 to 120 years before its actual time. But uh, the Artaxerxes mentioned here is not called Artaxerxes II, and it would make no sense for him to be called Darius in the book of Ezra and then Artaxerxes. 
it, you know, that to me would imply that this is two different people. But it also doesn't make sense for uh, Artaxerxes to be against Judah and then to be after King Darius, another Artaxerxes, who is not named as the second and uh, was willing to help Judah. So I cannot be sure on this matter and I will have to leave it at that. I, uh, the only reason I'm pointing this out ahead of time is because I am sure there are some of you out there who are scholars of God's Word who, uh, in listening to these studies, will say, well, wait a minute. You know, this is not adding up chronologically for there to be an Artaxerxes after Darius and before Darius. And you would be right. It doesn't make sense to me either. And again, I am an honest person who teaches the word the best I can, but there is simply no way for me to know uh, why there is this discrepancy. Um, I would think, this being the book of Ezra, this would be one of the most accurate books in the Bible, since Ezra and Nehemiah came up with the Masoretic text, and uh, w which locked in the Hebrew letters of the Hebrew alphabet and the Hebrew words and um, made them where they could not be changed. However, in the history of man we know that the Kenites have always been scribes that is to say after they got into the scribeship and uh, they may have had their dirty little fingers on this and are trying to confuse things. If they have it has certainly worked in this case because uh, I am unable to find out the truth about this. And uh, I can't let it hold me up in this particular study. Um, I'm not really happy about this, but uh, we have to keep moving on with the Word of God. And the events that happen are really more important than who is king at the time. It, that at least in my mind but um, anyway I just wanted to make that point and uh, let you know you know when I don't know something I won't teach it as uh, as fact or as a historical fact because uh, I like to be as accurate as I can with regards to these things Anyway, we're going to begin today in the book of um, Ezra chapter 5. And before we begin, as always, let us go to our Father's throne and ask for guidance and wisdom as we study this, His most holy word. So let us pray. Our glorious Heavenly Father, we come before you this day and we ask for wisdom and knowledge and understanding of these things. To be sure, we are human beings, Father, and we don't always grasp what may be right in front of us. Even those who are learned of the Word, we still make mistakes. And perhaps I am making one. If I am, I ask correction and guidance with regards to this. But we ask, Father, that you open the eyes and ears of all who study with us, that they may receive truth in our limited abilities to teach. And uh, we ask this of you, Father, because we know you are the beginning of all wisdom, the revealer of secrets, the bringer of truth. So we petition you, Father, and ask for this truth, for that living water, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Yeshua Messiah, Amen. So, Ezra chapter 5 and verse 1. Then the prophets, Haggai, the, pro, uh, the prophet, and Zechariah, the son of Edo, these would be the two minor prophets that we just finished up, prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and in Jerusalem, in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them. Verse 2. 
Then rose up Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, and Joshua, the son of Josadak, and began to build the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. And with them were the prophets of God helping them. In other words, these prophets mentioned. The, <coughs> the two prophets, Haggai and... Um, Zechariah, excuse me. Verse 3. At the same time came Tatnai, governor on this side of the river, and Shetharbosnai, their companions, or and their companions, and said thus unto them, Who hath commanded you to build this house and to make up this wall? Verse 4. Then said we unto them after this manner, what are the names of the men that make this building? In other words, this is put in the form of the question. In other words, what are the names of the men that uh, are putting up this building? Is that what you want to know? Verse 5. But the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews, and they could not cause them to cease. In other words, these ones that are coming questioning, they could not cause the Jews to cease from building. Till the manor came to Darius. So, here we have Darius. Then they returned answer by letter concerning this matter. Verse 6. The copy of the letter that Tatnai, governor on this side of the river, and Shetharbosnai and his companions, the Asfarsakites, which means those that cause division, which were on this side of the river, sent unto Darius the king. Verse 7. They sent a letter unto him, wherein was written thus, Unto Darius the king all peace. In other words, a standard greeting. Verse 8. Be it known to the king that we have went into the province of Judea, to the house of the great God, which is builded with great stones, and timber is laid in the walls. And this work goeth fast on, and prospereth in their hands. Verse 9. Then asked we those elders, and said unto them thus, Who commanded you to build this house, and make up these walls? After all, it was told in the previous chapters that Artaxerxes had said that you shall not build this place. Verse 10. We asked their names also to certify thee. In other words, so that we could certify their names to you, that we might write the names of the men that were the chief of them. In other words, who, who was behind the building of this temple? Verse 11. And thus they returned us answer, saying, We are the servants of the God of heaven and earth, and build the house that was builded these many years ago, which a great king of Israel builded and set up. In other words, Solomon. Verse 12. But after that our fathers had provoked the God of heaven to wrath, he gave them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, the Chaldean, who destroyed this house and carried away the people into Babylon. Again, type of the Antichrist carrying people into confusion. Verse 13. But in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Babylon, now it says Cyrus king of Babylon here, not Cyrus king of Persia. That's because Cyrus captured Babylon. The same King Cyrus made a decree to build the house of God. Now, Cyrus would be the king that would conquer Babylon and take control. So he was the first king of this line, or this particular line of the king of the Medo-Persians. So we know that Cyrus was first. Verse 14. And the vessels also of gold and silver of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took out of the temple that was in Jerusalem, and brought them into the temple of Babylon, those did Cyrus, the king, take out of the temple of Babylon, and they were delivered unto one whose name is Sheshbazar, whom he had made governor. And Sheshbazar means the uh, worshiper of fire. Verse uh, 15. And said unto him, Take these vessels, go, and carry them into the temple that is in Jerusalem, and let the house of God be builded in, its, in his place. Verse 16. Then came the same Sheshbazar, 
and laid the foundation of the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. And since that time, even till now, it hath been in building, yet it is not finished. That's uh, a little bit incorrect, because building had ceased because of the uh, um, commandment by Artaxerxes, verse 17. Now, therefore, if it seem good to the king, let there be a search made of the king's treasure house, which is there at Babylon, whether it be so, that a decree was made by Cyrus the king to build the house of God at Jerusalem, and let the king send his pleasure to us concerning this matter. In other words, let, tell us what your will is about this. And of course, um, King Darius is going to search the records, and he will find record, and uh, the kings of this time did obey the laws of previous kings, so he will honor Cyrus's command. Ezra chapter 6 and verse 1. Then Darius the king made a decree, and search was made of the house of the rolls, that is to say the scrolls, where the treasures were laid up in Babylon. In other words, if it's there, it's going to be in this place. Verse 2. And there was found at Achmetha, in the palace that is in the province of the Medes, a roll. And therein was the record thus written. Verse 3. In the first year of Cyrus the king, the same King Cyrus made a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the house be builded. Let the place where they offered sacrifices and let the foundations thereof be strongly laid. And the height thereof, three score cubits. That's uh, 60 cubits. And the breadth thereof, three score cubits. That's also 60 cubits. And uh, verse 4. With three rows of great stones and a row of new timber, and let the expenses be given out to the king's house. In other words, send the bill to me. Verse 5. And let the golden and silver vessels of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took forth out of the temple, which is at Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, be brought unto Babylon, and be restored and brought again to the temple, which is at Jerusalem every one to his place, and place them in the house of God. Verse 6. Therefore, now therefore, Tatnai, governor beyond the river, Sheth uh, Arbaznai, and your companions, the Apharsachites, which are beyond the river, be ye far from thence. In other words, back away, and, uh, don't cause any trouble. Verse 7. Let the work of the house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews build this house of God in his place. And it was the place that God chose. Verse 8. Moreover, I will make a decree what ye shall do with the elders of the Jews, or these Jews, for the building of this house of God. That of the king's goods even the tribute beyond the river forthwith expenses be given to these men, and they be not hindered. Verse 9. And that which they have need of, both young bullocks and rams and lambs, for the burnt offering, plural, of the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, and oil, according to the appointment of the priests which are in at Jerusalem, let it be given them day by day without fail. Verse 10, that they may offer sacrifices of sweet savors to the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and his sons. In other words, this is going to work out good for Cyrus because these priests will be blessing him. Verse 11, also I have made a decree that whatsoever, or whosoever rather, shall alter this word, and this goes right back to the book of Daniel, the, the uh, word of the kings of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. In other words, this is why King Darius will obey the proclamation of King Cyrus. Once a king writes something down, it becomes law, and not even a king of future can, can rescind that law. Let timber be pulled down from his house, and being set up, let him be hanged thereon, and let his house be made a dunghill for this. 
In other words, for insulting God and stopping the building of God's temple. Verse 12. And the God hath caused his name to dwell there, destroy all kings and people. Now let me read that again. And the God that hath caused his name to dwell there, destroy all kings and people, that shall put their hand to the altar or destroy the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. Darius have made a decree, let it be done with speed. In other words, Darius has read the letter of Cyrus with the decree, and now Darius is reaffirming it. In other words, he's saying, okay, I found the letter of Cyrus. It is law. It will be done. Verse 13. Then Tatnai, the governor on this side of the river, Shethar Bosnai and their companions, according to that which Darius the king had sent, so they did speedily. Verse 14. And the elders of the Jews builded, and they prospered, through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Edo, and they builded and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel and according to the commandment of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. Now, this sentence would seem to imply that Darius could be Artaxerxes. In other words, this would not be the first time that we would see a person in the Bible named by two names. In other words, uh, Simon Peter, um, Simon Bar Jonah. Um, you know, Jesus is called Emmanuel, and um, otherwise, I mean, Darius is the one who wrote this decree, so he is alive now. And Cyrus, we know, has already passed on or is no longer king. Uh, probably he's already dead. And since Darius is the one in writing this, and he wrote Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, as well, then either Artaxerxes is before Darius or he is Darius. So, you know, you're going to have to go with your best guess on that. Like I said, I have... I have... Uh, wrenched my guts about this before recording this lecture and uh, looked into it and looked into it and I have been unable to ascertain but it makes sense that Artaxerxes would be Darius but it also doesn't make sense that Artaxerxes in the first place way back in chapter 4 would stop the building so uh, perhaps he had a change of heart perhaps finding the scroll is what changed his heart, and he is the Artaxerxes of chapter 4. It's not really known, and it's not really made clear in the Bible. Because if you go and look up Artaxerxes in the Strong's Concordance, it will just give you a definition of his name. And there is no real usage, because it is of a foreign aspect. In other words, it comes from the Syriac Aramaic, and likewise Darius. So... Again, go on your best guess. The events are more important than the kings in the first place. Verse 15. And this house was finished on the third day of the month of Adar, which was, the, which was in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king, or Darius. Verse 16. And the children of Israel, the priests, and the Levites... Now I want you to make special note there that there are priests and there are Levites. Uh, Levites were always to be the priests of the uh, temple. They were always to be the teachers of the word. However, there were priests that had other duties. And uh, you see here that there is the word priests and then there is the Levites. So, um, you've got Israel capitalized, priests not capitalized, and Levites capitalized. That's usually a sign right there. Um, we know that the Kenites were involved, the Nethanims, that is to say, in building this house. And the Nethanims made up more people than just the Kenites. But uh, the priest mentioned here 
are, would be much like it is today in the churches. Whether you're in a Catholic church or a Protestant church, there are levels of preachers or, or priests. Uh, there are the evangelists, there are preachers, there are pastors, there are youth pastors, there are deacons. And in the Catholic church, there are um, cardinals, bishops, uh, the pope, um, archbishops, um, friars, and even fathers, which you're not supposed to call man any father upon the, uh, any man father upon the earth, for there is only one father. But be that as it may, uh, there were levels of priests even back in this time. However, the Levitical priests were the ones who were the ones that were allowed to enter into the tabernacle. In other words, the Kenites were never, ever supposed to enter into the tabernacle. However, man is lazy, and uh, man is forgetful, and though they do recognize these people as the Nethanims, and they could not prove their genealogy, they have become priests and they have become scribes. And eventually, within the next 380 years to the time of Christ, or so, uh, it's actually less than 380 now, because we're about six years hence from the beginning of this, so about uh, 374, 374 years from now or so, Christ will be born. And then about 30 years after that, the scribes and Pharisees will cause his death, because they will be the chief priests. They will not be appointed by God, they will be appointed by Rome. And, um, you know, just keep that in mind as you are doing this study. That uh, just because someone is called a priest doesn't mean they're of God. And that's true even in the churches of today. But anyway, the children of Israel, the priests, and the Levites, notice they're kept separate, and the rest of the children of the captivity kept the dedication of the house of God with joy. Verse 17. And they offered at the dedication of the house of God a hundred bullocks and two hundred rams and four hundred lambs for a sin offering. And for all Israel, twelve he goats, according to the number of the tribes of Israel. Even though the other ten tribes are not present. They're gone into cap or they're gone their captivity is over, but they're gone over the mountains of the Caucasus now. And they're on their way to fulfill their destiny of Europe. Verse eighteen. And they set priests in their divisions. There you go right there. They set priests in divisions. In other words, according to what you will do and, and what you will do. And the Levites in their courses. So we see now that they've got different duties. For the service to God, which was at Jerusalem, as it is written in the book of Moses. And that's not really quite true, because if they had followed the book of Moses, the Nethanims, that is to say the Kenites, would not have been allowed anywhere near the congregation, neither the outer court. Verse 19. And the children of the captivity kept the Passover upon the 14th day of the first month. In other words, the month of Abib, as written in the law, the Torah. Verse 20. And the priests and the Levites were pur purified together. All of them were pure, and that's really not quite true, but they were probably purified. And killed the Passover for all the children of the captivity, and for their brethren the priests, and for themselves. Verse 21. And the children of Israel, which were come again out of captivity, and all such as had separated themselves unto them from the filthiness of the heathen of the land, which, you know, that's, that's, that's a wise idea, no matter whether you're a priest or not. The filthiness of the heathen of the land was their worship of false gods and their uh, things that they did, including eating unclean animals. To seek the Lord God did eat. Verse 22. And they kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy. And the Lord made them joyful, and turned the heart of the king of Assyria unto them. In other words, th this would not be any of the kings of Assyria that we've read of in the past. This is a new king of Assyria. But uh, no doubt he was probably scared that uh, Israel was going to rise up again, as in previous days. 
However, God turned his heart to him, or to them, and, you know, that is the case with our Father. He can change hearts and minds. He can harden a man's heart as he did Pharaoh, or he can turn a heart to you. And he turned the heart of the king of Assyria unto them to strengthen their hands in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. Ezra chapter 7. And here we go again. I want to point out what it says in Daniel chapter 9 verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ashazerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. Now, I only mention that again so that you know that it says he is the son of Ashazerus, which in Hebrew could mean grandson, great-grandson. It, 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 as it says, he is of the seed of the Medes. It just means he's of that line. But uh, now we're going to get to Artaxerxes, verse 7. Ver, or chapter 7, verse 1. Now after these things, and since this says it this way, after these things, this doesn't mean we're going back in time. In the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, the son of Siriah, the son of Azariah, the son of Hilkiah, uh, basically what we're going to do here is prove that Ezra is a Levite. We're going to take him all the way back to Aaron here. So that's why we're going to read these names. Ezra, the son of Siriah, the son of Azariah, the son of Hilkiah, verse 2, the son of Shalom, the son of Zadok, which means the just or upright, the son of Ahitib, the son of Amariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Mirioth, verse 4, the son of Zerahiah, the son of Uzziah, the son of Bukai, verse 6, the son of Abishua, the son of Phinehas. Now here we're getting to those recognizable names. The son of Eleazar, and this Eleazar was the son of Aaron. And it, and it says so right here. It's the son of Aaron, the chief priest. This, w this would be Aaron, the brother of Moses, the beginning of the house of the Levites. And as we know, if you covered the Bible with me to this point, we went through Eleazar and we went through Phinehas. And Eleazar is basically the equivalent of Lazarus, or Lazarus, which um, has to do with Jesus resurrected Lazarus from the dead, okay? And that has to do spiritually with the resurrecting of the priesthood by Christ. It wasn't just that he could raise people from the dead. It was the same thing as in Ezekiel when he prophesied to the dry bones. That's why this one was named Lazarus, which if you look at it, it is the same word as Eleazar. It means the exact same thing. Verse 6. And Ezra went up from Babylon. In other words, Ezra came out of Babylon, which, which is symbolic of coming out of confusion. And we've established that he is a true Levite. And he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses. In other words, he was very familiar with the word and he was ready to uh, get down to business with the law of Moses which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord God, or his God upon him. Verse 7. And there went some, uh, some, I don't want you to skip over that word, verse 7, and there went up some of the children of Israel and of the priests, and of the Levites, and the singers, and the porters, and the Nethanims. There they are, the Nethanims, the Kenites, unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. Now, this is what this is another thing that leads me to believe that this Artaxerxes is actually Darius, because the temple was finished in the sixth year, and now we're in the seventh year of Artaxerxes. In the last chapter, you will notice it said it was the sixth year of um, Darius. Well, now it says it's the seventh year of Artaxerxes. So I think, 
this Darius is the Artaxerxes. And I think that's why it, I couldn't locate him in the studies because they show Darius in the king lines that I looked at of the kings of Persia as two different people. And uh, again, there were scholars who made notes that Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, and Darius were the same. But, you know, when it comes to the work of scholars, you've got to be very careful, and I always am. But, uh, you know, I even listened to some of Pastor Murray's lectures uh, concerning this study, um, and he did not even make this clear. And, you know, Pastor Murray is usually one that, uh, for those of you who study with the Shepherd's Chapel, usually goes through everything with a fine-tooth comb, but uh, even he made no mention of Artaxerxes and Darius being one and the same. That is not to say that he never has in other teachings from other years, but uh, in the lectures that I looked at, you know, in searching this, like I said, I spent a little bit of time on this. I uh, could find no differentiation, so... Uh, I, I actually think that this Artaxerxes is Darius. Darius. Verse 8. Uh, not only by what is written by Daniel, but by what is written here. Verse 8. And he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was the seventh year of the king. And again, there you go. Seventh year, sixth year in the last chapter. It, it, it's pretty self-evident that this Artaxerxes is Darius. Verse 9. But that only leads me to a little bit more confusion about who was the first Artaxerxes who stopped the building of the temple. Perhaps it was the same Darius and he, uh, like I said, once he found the scroll of Cyrus, changed his mind. We know that God has the ability to change minds, but again, if I am not 110% dead sure about something, I will not teach it as far as fact. I will lay it out for you because we have to in continuity to study the Bible. I can't skip a chapter or skip two chapters of the Bible because I don't understand them. So I will lay it out and uh, maybe one of you out there who is gifted in our Father's Word can uh, correct me on this. Who knows? Maybe somebody listening will write me and say I have found uh, what you're looking for. And that'll be completely fine with me. I can accept correction with the best of them. Uh, that's what we study the Word of God for, is to be corrected. And uh, as I've stated many times, uh, I I'm a student of 26 years of the Bible in Hebrew and Greek, and Chaldee, Syriac Aramaic, that is to say, and... Um, even in going through the Bible these many times, I uh, never really put that much emphasis upon these kings, but uh, I, I never thought to teach the Bible myself, but because of the events that happened not long ago where some of the lectures were taken down that I had up, I uh, decided that I would give it a shot. And... Uh, I don't claim to be perfect. I can be mistaken. I am a human being, and that's why I always suggest, uh, strongly suggest, that you go behind me and check me out to make sure that what I'm telling you is correct and true. You know, that's not only will that edify you in in, in learning, but uh, you know, it, it may give you the ability to write me and say, "Hey, I know something you don't know. Here, look at this." You know, Th there are people that do that now when. I, I am very sorry to say they they do not know what they're talking about because they will use scriptures that really have nothing to do in Hebrew with what they're making them imply in English. But, uh, you know, that's, that's par for the course. God gives sight to who he will and he puts slumber upon others. And God bless all of us. Verse 9. Upon, for upon the first day of the month... Uh, began he to go up from Babylon. And on the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem, according to the good hand of God that was upon him. Verse 10. For Ezra prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it, 
and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. In other words, this is a zealous man and he wants to put Israel back right. And that's why he was one of God's remnant, one of God's chosen to be quite frank. Verse 11. Now this is the copy of the letter that King Artaxerxes, probably Darius, gave to Ezra the priest, the scribe, even a scribe of words of the commandments of the Lord and his statutes to Israel. Verse 12. Artaxerxes, king of kings unto Ezra, the priest, a scribe of the law of the God of heaven, perfect peace and at such a time. In other words, that's a, that's a, that's a little bit more than a standard greeting there. That's, that's like saying God speed to you. Verse 13, I make a decree that all they of the people of Israel, of the priests and the Levites in my realm, which are minded of their own free will to go up to Jerusalem, go with thee. In other words, it's, it's their free will. They can stay here in Babylon if they like. Or they can go up with you and be part of the tribes of Israel that go back to Judea, Jerusalem, Canaan, the land of Canaan. Verse 14, for as much as thou art sent of the king and of his seven counselors to inquire concerning Judah and Jerusalem according to the law of thy God which is in thine hand verse 15 and to carry the silver and gold which the king and his counselors have freely offered unto the God of Israel whose habitation is Jerusalem that ought to tell you something right there verse 16 and all the silver and gold that thou can find in the province of Babylon with the free will offering of the people and of the priests offering willingly for the house of their God which is in Jerusalem. In other words, take as much as you can that people will give you and that plus we're giving you that uh, old Nebuchadnezzar had taken from you plus probably some that they added to it. Do you, Apparently this uh, king, this king Artaxerxes, whether he be Dyrus or not, is a very good king and uh, fears the Lord God. Verse 17. That thou mayest buy speedily with this money bullocks, rams, lambs, and their meat offerings and drink offerings, and offer them upon the altar of the house of your God, which is in Jerusalem. Verse 18. And whatsoever shall seem good to thee, and to thy brethren to do with the rest of the silver and gold, that do the will of your God. Or that do after the will of your God. In other words, ask counsel at the Lord of what you're to do with it, and whatever he tells you, do with it. Verse 19. The vessels also that are given thee for service of the house of thy God, those deliver before the God of Jerusalem. Verse 20. And whatsoever more shall be needful for the house of thy God, which thou shall have occasion to bestow, bestow it out of the king's treasure house. In other words, I'll, I'll, I will give it to you. Verse 21. And I, even I, Artaxerxes the king, do make a decree to all the treasurers which are beyond the river, that whatsoever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, shall require of you, it shall be done speedily. In other words, no playing around. Whatever Ezra tells you to do, you do. Verse 22. Unto an hundred talents of silver, unto an hundred measures of wheat, unto an hundred baths of wine, unto an hundred baths of oil, and salt without prescribing how much. In other words, as much salt as he wants. No, no amount is too much. Verse 23. Whatsoever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be diligently done for the house of the God of heaven. For why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and his sons? In other words, th this guy's smart. He, he, he's, he's very well um, aware of who is God. And he wants to please God. Verse 24. Also we certify you that touching any of the priests, the Levites, the singers, the porters, the Nathanims, or ministers of the house of God, shall not be lawful to impose toll, tribute, custom upon them. And, uh, you know, our own government could learn a little bit about this.
because they are now starting to tax churches. For one thing, they're at war with Christians. I mean, people don't realize it. They're blind to it. But just look at the policies they set up. They're at war with Christians. It's Cold War. I mean, it's not like they're coming after us with guns and uh, weapons, but uh, they hate Christians. Oh, we do not hate Christians. Where do you get that from? Look at your laws and policies. They speak louder than your words. Verse 25. And thou, Ezra, after the wisdom of thy God that is in thine hand, set magistrates and judges, which may judge all the people that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God, and teach ye them that know them not. In other words, you, you, you teach them the word of God. Verse 26. And whosoever will not obey the law of thy God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed speedily upon him, whether it be unto death or banishment or confiscation of goods or imprisonment or to imprisonment. In other words, this, this guy's serious. Verse 27. Verse 27. Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers, which has put such a thing in the king's heart, to the beauty of the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. Verse 28. And hath extended his mercy unto me before the king and his counselors and before all the king's mighty princes. And I was strengthened as the hand of the Lord my God was upon me. And I gathered together out of Israel all the chief men to go up with me. Now, I would go on into um, Ezra 8, but uh, as you probably know, I like to end these on the end of a chapter rather than, uh, you know, I, I love Shepherd's Chapel and Pastor Murray, but one thing that I really hate is when Pastor Murray stops in the middle of a lecture because you just want to keep going, you know. So I like to end these at the end of a lecture, uh, the end of a chapter rather. And um, not only that, the, the next chapter, Ezra chapter 8, is going to be a very pivotal chapter in the Word of God because it is going to be the time when you see the Nethanim rise themselves up. In other words, this is going to be the beginning of the takeover. They're already priests and they're already scribes. And uh, from this point out in history, in other words, we're some uh, 374 years or so, roundabout, you know, I'm just giving you a rough estimate here, from the birth of Christ. And within the next 370 years of this timeline, from Ezra to the birth of Christ, the scribes and Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees, will rise up, and they will be of these Nethanim. And uh, they will be of these that could not prove their genealogy, that could not prove that they were Israel, and they were seen as polluted in an earlier uh, chapter. But nevertheless, man is forgetful. And as man forgets, in other words, they will not keep the classification of Nethanim. They will become priests. As a matter of fact, in the next chapter, poor old Ezra is going to have to send back to get actual Levites because he won't have any Levites with him. He's going to have to send back to, to uh, pick up some Levites because the people that are with him that are priests are not going to be Levites. And uh, if you want the truth about it, they're going to be these Nethanim. They're going to be Kenites, or they're going to be peoples of the land that sojourned with Israel who were not Kenites, but were also be, became priests and scribes. But moreover, if you read John chapter 8 and Matthew chapter 23 and uh, the parable of the tares and the wheat you will understand how that these uh, offspring of the viper, these Kenites, these sons of Cain, 
these Rechabites, these uh, children of the house of Hamath, um, are going to take over. In other words, in the last lecture we covered how they infiltrated Israel in the time of Joshua. They claimed to be Hivites of Gibeon. Well, they weren't. They were Kenites. And that's when they infiltrated the tribes of Israel. And they stayed with the tribes of Israel. Even when the ten tribes dispersed to the north in the Assyrian captivity, a portion of the Kenites went with them. And they have stayed amongst them. Even unto this day. And they have caused many of the things that have happened in the world. Uh, many of the wars. They've brought down kingdoms. They've lifted up kingdoms. They have infiltrated the churches. Not only the Catholic, but the Protestant. They were instrumental in bringing forth things like the uh, Salem witch hunts, and before that, the Spanish Inquisition. And um, the reason we know this is because real priests of God would not do things like this. Now, I'm not saying that priests of God weren't misled by the Kenites to help them in this and aid them and abed them in this. But anyone that's got God in their heart and is at peace with themselves and knows the word of God knows that nowhere in the word of God does it say torture people until they confess where you can kill them. But the Kenites always disregard the word of God. They always deny the truth. They always spin it. And they're doing it now. Here, even in the United States of America, and in Europe, they're doing it. They are socializing us. They have entered their four hidden dynasties, which are the educational system, the economical system, the political system, and the religious system. That's their four weapons. And they have been entrenched in religion a lot longer than people think. And they are surely within the bounds of politics as is made self-evident by the ways that our politicians lie to us openly in front of the cameras. And then when they're called on it, that, that is to say, uh, the one or two times that they are called on it, they say, no, 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 you, you took my words out of context. You know, you, you misunderstood. Even though we've got it on film, you know, or on, on video. They will even deny saying what they said. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know how many of you listen to uh, some of the more famous conservative talk radio hosts, but, uh, you know, they play these clips of these people saying one thing one day, and then two days later they're asked about it, and they say, no, 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 I didn't say that. And then they play the clip for them, and then they say, uh, well, uh, okay, yeah, you know, I, it seems like I do remember saying that, but, but that's totally taken out of context. You know, that's, that's the method of the Kenite. And, and I'm not saying that all politicians are Kenites. Uh, moreover, most of them are puppets on the strings of the Kenites. The Kenites have always controlled commerce. Uh, for the longest time now, they've controlled politics. They control education now. They control, um, basically, everything that you see. They control the media, Hollywood television, radio, magazines, newspapers. They control what your children are taught in school. In other words, that uh, there is no such thing as God. We evolved from apes. They control the laws. You know, we've got to have abortion, but we can't put serial killers to death. We can't put a pedophile in jail because we must understand their pain. I mean, you know, this stuff is so blatantly obvious. It is so blatantly obvious, and... and how you other people, my fellow Americans, can stand by for this is just beyond me. I mean, I, I must have written in, in my lifetime uh, uh, several hundred letters or more, I, maybe closer to five or six hundred letters over my uh, 47 years to senators, to congressmen, to um representatives to local and just simply asking them why are you doing these things why are you supporting things that are anti-christian which are openly anti-christian why are you siding with those that are against the bible 
And of course, you know, they always send you a generic computer generated letter back with, thank you for your concern. This issue is very important to your congressman. They never answer you. I mean, not really. And, uh, you know, they basically, it's like I've said in a couple of my previous lectures, they basically have a handbook. And it's basically the anti-Bible. In other words, if the Bible says don't do it, to them, it means do it. If the Bible says man shall not lie with man as woman, then you get out there and you have gay pride parades and you march right along with them arm in arm as if it's a march for freedom. And you go and uh, you put liberals in office and progressives, you might as well say socialists and communists, and uh, you get the vote of the gay and lesbian community by supporting them. In other words, you, you fight for their rights to be gay and lesbian. You know, they've already got the right to be gay and lesbian. God even gives them that right. You know that? A lot of people don't even realize that. Well, I've never seen that written in the Bible. That's right, you don't. But God did give man free will. God's not going to make anyone obey his commandments. I mean, they're going to suffer the consequences if they don't, but he's not going to make them any more than he's going to make any of his children love him who don't want to love him. You know, in the United States of America, you have the right to be gay. If you want to be gay, be gay. You know, that, that, that's your prerogative. If that's what you get off on, then, hey, go to it. Have yourself a ball. But don't try to enact laws saying that it's common and normal and should be treated as common and normal and taught in school. As a matter of fact, there was a sickening story this week that came out of where a teacher in, uh, not only one teacher, but several teachers made two girls, or, or not, not just two girls, but a whole classroom full of girls kiss each other to to learn tolerance and to be, they said it was to be able to teach them tolerance of this lifestyle and to also teach them other options besides boys. In other words, how to say no to a boy when he wants sex. You know, that is the biggest bunch of bullshit, excuse my French, that I have heard ever heard in my life. And you know that there are people out there that are just eating it up like it was, uh, the most tasty barbecued steak you could get off the grill. They just can't stand it, you know. And it really, it really astonishes me that my fellow Americans stand by for this, you know. And and when they when they offer a flimsy, whimsical, stupid, idiotic excuse like that for teaching young girls alternative lifestyles, which they claim they're not doing. Oh, no, no, we're not pushing the gay and lesbian agenda. We're teaching tolerance. Yeah, yeah, telling two girls to kiss in school. Can you imagine that happening in 1960 or 1950 or 1940? Or uh, let me just put it right down to, uh, to the uh, glass packs, you might say. Could you imagine that happening before 1980, in any year, from, from 1980 all the way back, can you imagine that happening? Or uh, 1990 even, can you imagine that happening? You know why? Because it's never happened before. Just like in Boston, what we witnessed the other day, as terrible as it was, there has never been... Or there have never been policemen dressed in full body armor entering into people's them how people's houses, forcing them out onto the streets. There has never been a president who has signed so many executive orders into law, bypassing Congress and the Senate to do so. You know, where are you people? And especially you fellow Christians. 86% of this country is Christians. Where are you? Have you got your damn heads in the sand? I mean, I'm sorry if my language is a little bit offensive here, but where are you? What are you doing that you're not paying attention to this? Well, we didn't hear about it. 
Well, why didn't you hear about it? What, what were you watching? CNN or MSNBC or CNBC? They're not going to tell you. What are you waiting to see the story in the newspaper? If you do see it at all, it's going to be on the very back page in small writing in a column about maybe three inches tall and two inches wide. You know, it's not going to be front page news because it's part of the liberal, communist, socialist agenda. To, to, to do away with everything that has been, to, to make this new order, this new world order of secularism against God, to do away with all that has been. To make that which is wrong out to be right, and to make that which is right out to be wrong. You know, I'm sorry if I'm going over on my time here. I didn't want to, but... You know, 86% of America are people of faith. And the vast, vast majority of them are Christians. Where are you Christians? What are you doing? That you're letting this happen. Where were you when the people were arrested in the lunchroom for praying? You, you know, uh, are Christians become so wussified now that they can't get out and march on Washington or march around a school like the liberals do? I mean, you piss off a liberal and guess what, buddy? They're going to come down on you like a ton of bricks. They'll, they'll bust people in from other states to, uh, to uh, protest you. You know, you of modern Israel are not very much different than those of old Israel. Because you don't stand for anything. You know, Christians have suffered much down through the ages. They have been tossed in the dens of lions. They have been put before gladiators. They have been hung up on crosses. They have been tortured slowly to death. They have been burned with fire, burned at the stake, and they wouldn't give up their Christianity. Who do you think was in charge of that? Who do you think brought that about? Christians? It wasn't Christians, brothers and sisters. Christians don't do that to Christians. Well, it most certainly was Christians. The Spanish Inquisition was all about religion. No, the Spanish Inquisition uh, was all about people who got into the power of the church and abused it and used religion as a tool. Well, you're starting to sound like the president now. He's saying religion is evil. It's not religion that's evil. It's when people go against the word of God that it becomes evil. When you go against the word of God, you know... I really wish I had a time machine so I could go back to that time and speak to some of these inquisitors and say, do you not know what you're doing is against the law of God? And I'm sure that they would uh, try to convince me that I was wrong and that I don't know what I'm talking about as many try to convince me now uh, about many of the things. L listen. Listen to the first part of this lecture. If I'm wrong about something or I don't know, I'll tell you. You know, that that's that's how we get edification. That's how we learn. But uh, this whole idea uh, of Christians sitting on their hands and allowing this stuff to come to pass is really beginning to uh, not only be annoying, but... Uh, you know, if you keep doing it, they're going to keep taking ground from you. What do you think is going to happen? You know, if there are two armies at war with each other, and they're fighting in the middle of the field, and all of a sudden once army starts backing up, one army starts backing up, then the other army, guess what they're going to do? They're not going to back up. They're going to go forward. So what do you think is going to happen if you keep doing nothing? You know, I, I'm not talking about those of you who study our Father's Word and, and do your part and write your senators and congressmen and sign the petitions and do the things that you can. I'm talking about those Christians who don't do anything, who are so consumed with watching television or playing on the computer 
or doing whatever it is they do, polishing their boats, polishing their new Dodge Challenger. Yeah, I got me a Dodge Challenger RT with the 446 pack. You ought to see it. That sucker will do 0 to 60 in about uh, 4.7 seconds. You know? Well, that's really impressive. And I, believe me, I love old cars and I love new Dodge Challengers. They're, they're pretty. You know? Very nice. But uh, y you know what? The Word of God comes first. And if you don't stand for God, you know, what do you think God's going to do for you? You know, what did Jesus say? If you're ashamed before men of me, then I'm going to be ashamed before God for you. Stand up and do something. We know that world government is coming, okay? We know that. We know we can't stop that. That's in the Word of God. That's written. That's done. It is going to come to pass. But how far we let them take us is, towards communism is a different matter. How many of our rights we allow them to take away is a different matter. How many people we allow them to do wrong and call it justice is a different matter. Stand up, Christians. Who is for God? Remember the words of Moses when he said, Who is for God? Who came running to him? The Levites. That's why the Levites were chosen, quite frankly. Because they stood for God. And they have always been the priests ever since. Except when the Kenites overtook them. They killed many of them. This Zechariah that we've been reading of, he'll be killed. The son of Berechiah, he'll be killed. Between the altar and the temple, he'll be killed. And Jesus will make mention of his name. Not to mention all the others they killed, and not to mention the apostles, and Jesus, Yeshua Christos, Jesus Christ himself, who was killed at their behest. What are you waiting on to stand up, Christians? What's it going to take to make you understand that these people are not going to stop? They're not going to stop taking ground from you. They're going to make it so that you have to hide your Bible. You're going to have to hide your Bible if you don't stop them. If they catch you worshiping, they're going to put you in jail. Well, it says in the Bible that the devil's going to throw some of you in jail. Yeah, he will when, when he's here. But I'm talking about before he gets here. How much longer will you wait? What's it going to take to get a march of Christians on Washington so massive that it terrifies the congressman and the senator and even, yes, our dear glorious president? And I, when I say terrify, I don't mean terrify him with uh, fear of being killed or anything like that. I mean fear as in, look what you've got against you. Look at the number of Christians who are not for you. And you people coming into the country illegally who are Christians, Catholics, how dare you vote for socialists? What is wrong with you? You want freedoms so bad that you're willing to walk miles across the border to come to the land of the free, and yet you would help to take the freedoms away. What is wrong with you? Putting socialists into office because they pander to you. You better wake up. You better do some serious thinking in your heart. You better look at their policies and see what they're doing to Christians like you. You know, there's an old saying that it, it ne no one is bothered until it strikes home. Well, it hasn't struck your home yet. That's the only reason you don't act. But by the time you decide to act, in other words, when it does strike your home, it may be too late to act. What is it going to take, Christians, to get you to stand up for your God? To say no more. 
We are the children of the living God. His hand is upon us. If God be for us, none can be against us. What are you scared of? Your government? That's what they want you to be, you know. They want you to be scared of them. So that they can back you into a corner and tell you how it's going to be. Well, that ain't the way it's supposed to be. This is a government of the people. By the people and for the people. And if it is a government for the people, by the people and of the people, then if 86% of this nation are Christians, then where are you 86%? You know how much percentage that leaves against you? 14%. Have you not understood the words of God where it says uh, a hundred shall come in against you and they shall put a thousand to flight? That's what you're allowing. It's supposed to be the other way around. I suggest many of you start doing a lot of praying and ask God what He wants you to do. As well as study from His Word to understand these things. And I realize I'm coming off a little bit harsh here, but you know what? It's time these things get said. It's time these things get said. This this burying your head in the sand and being quiet, being sweet little simpering Christians that lay down. Well, that's what Jesus did. He didn't defend himself. And we're supposed to be like Jesus. Really? Really? Do you remember Jesus marching into the temple and overturning the money changers' tables and whipping them with a scourge? Does that sound like a sweet little lamb that laid down and took it? Do you remember the number of times Jesus said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! He wasn't being sweet and nice to them. He wasn't kissing their rings and bowing down to them. You know, like our president does to the king of Saudi Arabia. What do you suppose was behind that? It should be the other way around. The king of Saudi Arabia should be bowing to the man who holds the office of the most powerful nation on earth. But for some odd reason, it's the reverse. You know, everything is the reverse now. What's it going to take, brothers and sisters? It's your choice. I suggest you wake up. Unless you want to be living in the union of socialist, socialist Soviet United States. Because that's where we're headed. That's where they will try to take us. We don't have to put up with that. We do have to go into one world order and we do have to go into captivity of the Antichrist for a time. But we do not have to go into communism. We do not have to go gently into that good night. We do not have to lay down like simpering little sheep and take this. And I'm not saying go and grab weapons and start a civil war. You know, uh, Martin Luther King knew how to peacefully um, protest. Arm in arm with other people. Peacefully protest. Not that I agree with all that he did. Not that I agree with the people that uh, claim him as their idol, such as some some reverends who uh, are clearly racist themselves, very famous reverends, I might add. Two of them I can think of. One who ain't so sharp, and the other one who's uh, uh, a, a jack of all trades when it comes to uh, misleading people. But what's it going to take for you Christians? I don't care what color you are. I don't care what your nation of origin is. If you wear the mantle of the word Christian, a Christ man, then you represent Christ. Are you embarrassed by Christ? 
Are you ashamed of your Lord and Savior? Are you ashamed of the God of Israel? If you are, then just keep doing what you're doing. Don't do anything. Go ahead and let them take us. But if you're not ashamed, stand up and make your voice heard. Talk to your neighbors. Talk to your friends. Form your own little community groups. Otherwise, you will be living in a secular nation where if you dare to even say I'm a Christian, you will have the threat of being arrested. Or who knows, maybe you'll get a ticket. Imagine that, a cop pulling you over because he sees a Christian cross on the back of your car and writing you a ticket for having it. And I know you think I'm kidding, and I know you think I'm joking, but you see if I'm joking. They have already arrested a people for praying in this country. Arrested for praying. Do you understand the seriousness of that? That? Arrested for praying to the Lord God Almighty. Well, that's where I'm going to end this particular study. I went way over. I'm sorry I didn't mean to. But uh, these things needed to be said. And somebody's got to say it eventually. I don't know... You know, I, I, I don't know if it's me, if it will be one of you. I mean, I'm saying it now, obviously, but uh, somebody needs to say these things. Need, we need to get the message out there. It's time to blow the trumpet, people. They're coming, and they're not going to stop. You better be prepared to stand up and do something. Unless you're ashamed of your God, and if you are... God help you. Quit calling yourself a Christian. Quit wasting your time. At any rate, this is where I'm going to end this Bible study and this now commentary, this rant, if you will. But I know those of you out there, my beautiful brothers and sisters in Christ, who feel the same way as I do, I know you're listening. I know you'll act. I know you'll be persecuted. And so will I. Gladly. For, the, for my Father. For my Christ. For my Savior. So, stay in the Word. Study to show yourself approved. And always, always pray to our Father. Asking guidance and wisdom as you go. And may God bless you and light the fire under you to make you stand up, those of you who won't, so that you will get up and make your voice heard for your God who has done everything for you. And those of you who study with us, quite frankly, I hope I haven't offended you by these words. If I have, I'm sorry, but like I said, these things need to be said, and... Um, you know, it's a little bit of my righteous indignation coming out. Usually I'm a very laid back, sweet guy. Probably one of the nicest guys you'd ever want to meet. But uh, I'm tired of seeing what's going on in my world. I don't recognize it anymore. And I know that there are certain things prophesied to happen in the Bible. But we don't have to stand still for this. We are children of the living God. Take that seriously. And may God bless you and pray for those poor, ignorant, blinded souls who can't see the truth. And even those poor, ignorant, Christian blinded souls who can't see the truth. And be thankful that you can. And may God bless you and fill your cup with wisdom and knowledge and understanding. Thank you for listening. This has been Just Thoughts.